You know, you do this enough times, and inevitably something always goes wrong. Every show, it's okay. We're here. We made it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's episode 128. It's, uh, what is it? It's May 6th. I still have in the show notes. Uh, 2019, you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. My name is Nick Rome. I'm your host. I'm joined today not by Blake Arnsdorf. He is out uh, on vacation. I'm here with Sabrina Moran. Hi, Nick. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. We got a lot to talk about today. We got some news from Google introducing a new feature to auto-delete your location and activity data, implications of RoboCop uh, making a traffic stop, uh, the seven requirements for building ethical AI, according to the EU Commission, and Korea's new 5G futuristic hospital we're going to talk about. Um, but first, I want to let everybody know that you can find us on uh, YouTube every Tuesday around noon Pacific. Uh, and you know what? I'm done with the begging. I'm done with the begging. Sabrina, you, you've listened to a couple episodes of the show. You know that every episode I beg. And why do I beg? I beg for that slash name so that other people can find it. We hit it. We hit the 100 mark. We changed our slash name. So thank you to everyone who subscribed and made that a reality. I am not going to beg anymore. But Sabrina, welcome to the show. This is your first time here. You're a little nervous. That's okay. Yep. We're, we're, we're going to have a good time. So uh, who are you? What, what can our listeners kind of expect from uh, your background to kind of flavor the news stories this week? All right. Well, my name is Sabrina, as he said. Uh, I'm pretty fresh out of grad school, about a year now. I've worked a lot with different types of interfaces, uh, usability evaluations, usability testing. Um, a side interest of mine is in vehicle technology, I would definitely say, um, especially interfaces that we reference while driving, distraction, um, basically anything human factors, just like you guys, I imagine. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, I think that is qualified enough to talk about stuff on the show. <laughs> But, Sabrina, we usually do a little bit of banter at the, at the top of the show. So what's going on in your life that's kind of human factors related? So I recently had this realization that I do a lot of things inefficiently on a daily basis. And it was kind of ironic to me because um, our job is actually to make tasks, especially common workflows, easier to do and more efficient. Um, and so something I realized is that I take three steps to get to most of the apps in my phone that I use every day on a daily basis, multiple times a day. And so I've actually became obsessively reorganizing my phone, trying to figure out the most efficient way to organize my apps. Um, and so, I, so how are you doing this? So you're, you're organizing your apps into like folders and stuff to make it more efficient for the things that you want to do? Yeah. And then I came to the idea that if they're in folders, it always takes two clicks to get to everything. Okay. Minimum. Which if you're using something multiple times a day, shouldn't it take one click? I have this back and forth. It's pretty obsessive at this point. I've reorganized my phone probably five times in the last week. Okay. And now I know where nothing is. So I I have something similar. So I organize my phone in a way where like all my viewing apps, like like uh, TV movies, mm. those are in one folder. My like reading apps are in another. My social media apps are in another. My work apps are in another. Um, and I've kind of organized them that way. And uh, it's it's never nested folders on my apps. Yeah. I don't know. So so where did you end up landing on that for now? Uh, in progress. I will have to get back to you on the <laughs> finals. Um, but I'm currently thinking one screen for things I use multiple times a day. So it's one click to get to them. And all my secondary apps will be in other screens inside of folders. Okay. Interesting. I have, so on my main screen, I have like, uh, you, you have iPhone, right? Yes, iPhone user. So I'm I'm an Android user and I have like a few select widgets that like I'll use. So I have like a, a shortcut to search. Um, I have a shortcut to my calendar and I have a shortcut to I almost feel like I have to cheat now to see what it is. Uh, I also have a shortcut to I'm cheating right now. Oh, a clock and my financials. So um, I have all those on the main screen. And it's kind of nice to have all those there. And if I need access to something else, something less frequent, then I'll put it on a separate page. Um, but the interesting thing about Android is that they have like, uh, well, they have different 
loaders first off, so you can uh, organize things differently. So on the bottom, um, there's like these other, uh, uh, I guess, app tray. It's like an app tray where you can put folders in there. And so like all my foldered stuff I put down there. So that okay. way I know kind of where I'm going to. If I swipe left, it's uh, one thing. If I swipe right, it's like more work related. So I kind of have it organized in my head that way, but I totally get that struggle. Yeah. One, I started this because I was using one too many clicks for things, but now I can't find anything at all. So arguably, I'm much less efficient now than I was before I started this whole quest. So it's almost, I don't know. I should just put it all back the way it was before I started, probably. You'll we'll get see. there. You'll I'll get, get there. there. If any of our listeners have any ideas for how to organize <laughs> your phone, too, hit us up. We're on I'll Slack. Be on the Slack, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, well, Sabrina, I got to talk about this thing that I've been playing around with. Um, it's called Dreams, and it's on PlayStation 4, and it's like this really, uh, I don't even know how to describe it other than saying it's like a, a game engine in a game. And so basically what it is right now, it's in uh, er, creator early access, which means if you buy into it early, you get it for a discounted rate, and it's meant for the people who want to create things. Hmm. And the way they do this is they have you basically, um, you can create anything in this game like literally people have recreated um some beloved levels from like mario and and other video game franchises um and they've created their own things as well and so uh the the way that this game i i hesitate to call it a game it's literally like a game engine um kind of gives you credit for building things is you can make something and then somebody else, like let's say you come in, you can take that thing, remix it and make it into something else. And it has this whole genealogy of how a creation came to be. And you can trace it all the way back to like the first thing it was made from. Wow. And like, yeah, it's really cool. Like I, I'm not, I'm not a guy who can create like art assets, but there are people that can. Yeah. So it's very free. You can do anything. There's a lot of options and you can create anything. And wow. it's it's crazy. So like I I suck at like the the creating art assets. I suck at creating like sculptures and um you can make like characters and scenery and um different things. But what I am good at is taking things that other people have made and kind of placing them all in the same environment to make a new thing and said this is mine with the help of all of you. And um, it gives you credit for that. So it gives, like, a separate, like, creation. Um, it's weird because they have, like, these little bars that indicate, like, oh, you're a player. So you like to play a lot of other people's stuff. You're a, um, your art or design um, or, so, like, the design would be more along the lines of what I'm doing is I'm designing a level. I'm not creating the thing. I'm designing it from all these scraps. The other thing that I've been super interested in and am super happy that it's giving credit to these people are cura curators. So uh, I every day go through and look for Star Wars assets. <laughs> of course. And I put together uh, all these fine additions to my collection. And um, so, <laughs> so now people can look up Star Wars, they'll see my collection, and it's like I've it's a collection of collections. So I have like one for lightsabers and one for characters and one for weapons and one for uh planets and if you go into each one of them it's all it's got you know the starfield background and the star wars font and i'm worried about copyright infringement but <laughs> who cares uh but it's really cool they give me credit for curating all this stuff and people can like and share and follow you and um it's just a really cool collaborative space for creating these environments yeah i don't really play video games very much but one that i do play occasionally is fortnite mm -hmm. and they have a creative mode where right. you can it gives you all the different pieces that they have and all their different uh, like cities and you can build your own city kind of in your own map and then you can visit other people's so right. it's probably a similar idea so it's it's kind of like that but imagine if in Fortnite you could design your own like walls and the yeah. walls didn't have to be bound to certain dimensions they could literally be a half wall with a diagonal um, and then think about 3D shapes as well you could make um, you know spheres and boxes and other things and then smash them together and make something else it's really cool I'll uh, I'll try to post a video for the uh, the video listeners watchers to so they can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'd here. be interested too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but you know what time it is, Sabrina? It's cool. your first time on the show, so we got to get you into. Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News, where we search all over the web to bring you topics the community is talking about. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game for us to talk about. This could be anything from we got some medical in there, privacy, security, 
robotics, AI, you name it, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages us to talk about it, it is fair game. Sabrina, what do we got up first this week? So Google is introducing a new feature to auto-delete your location and activity data. So knowing that our apps gather tons of information about us, some for years, um, can be a little unsettling. Uh, Google's various apps are chief among these, and the company has said that it's heard users' requests to make managing their data a simpler process. And so the company announced on Wednesday that they're rolling out a new feature to allow users to auto-delete their location and activity data after three or 18 months. Uh, this feature will extend to users' browser history in Chrome, as well as in-app data, and the Google Discover feature for Android. Uh, Google said that this feature will first arrive for location data before later expanding um, to web and app data in the upcoming weeks. So I don't know about you, Nick, but I've heard anything on the internet can't be deleted. It's kind of always there. So I'm a little bit unsure how they can really delete this data. That's probably true. And I wonder if it's like... Uh, it, it, in, in the sense of delete, I wonder if that just means it's no longer tied to you. Yeah. Um, however, that would worry me for a variety of reasons, especially with location data. That's that's incredibly like revealing. Um, you got your place of work and, and your home, right? And so, sure. But I, I still think this is a huge win for privacy, right? Because we've talked about privacy on the show before where uh, we, you know, it, it's like you said, it's difficult to delete the things that are tied to you. Uh, and can identify you, and now they're at least giving you the option to um, break after three months or I think eighteen months, right? That those are the two time frames. Yes. So I don't know. I don't. I don't see myself. Now here's the real like trick. Here's I. I don't see myself actually deactivating this now because they have all this history on me, and I feel like the. I don't know. I've talked about this on the show before. I feel like the pros outweigh the cons of them having information so now they can do targeted ads that you know i i like better uh but also that gives me to spend more money i don't know i'm really conflicted on it how do you feel sure. about this <laughs> well the whole idea of three or 18 months too is a little strange to me so they've had my location data associated with me for 18 months and then they're going to delete it i don't know it's kind of well what have they been doing with it for 18 months and why do i care you know a year and a half later right is it is it something that they've already kind of used and you know, yeah, exactly. It, is that window enough time for them to do something with it? Um, and I'd imagine so. Uh, so it's like delete my location data like seconds after I use it. Then, well, I mean, I they'd still have it. Yeah. Then, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a tricky situation, but at least you know they're giving that option to delete um, some of that data. I I don't know. It's a it's a really tricky thing because. I've I've definitely gone back. Have you ever done this where you've gone into your phone and it's like, where was I on this day like three years ago? No. Um, so you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. So like, uh, my partner, we've we've gone like th there are certain events, right? Like like our anniversary or something. I'll say like, hey, where we, what did we do like two years ago? I remember what we did last year. What did we do two years ago? And so I'll go in and to my location data and see like, oh yeah, we went to the aquarium two years ago. That's right. Um, and it's not something I would have remembered uh, unless I had that data available. So I don't know if that's something that other people do, but that's something weird that I do with my data. At least it's useful. Yeah, sure. How do, is that just like in your settings or something? Yeah, if you go, it's like Google Timeline or something. You wow. can go and check. Um, I'm going to have to check that out. I'm interested now. Yeah, I don't I don't know what it's called, um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you can see like your Google Maps Timeline. If you Google it, I'm sure you can find. Well, and Google um, Maps gets me everywhere, so I'm sure they have all my data every place I go. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm looking for it right now so you can see. Um, but I think, so if you go to Google Maps and then you go to your timeline, you can actually go back to any specific day. Um, but this is the type of data that they are actually, see, oh yeah, you can see my path here over the last couple of years, all the places I visited. And um, if you were to click on a location, you can see like, oh, last time I went to Philadelphia, uh, was for HFES this last, um, you know, th this last October, I guess it was, right? And so it tells you you were there uh, from September 29th to October 6th, 2018. I'm happy to divulge at least that much because some <laughs> of our listeners knew I was there. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And it'll tell you like, oh, you were in flight during this time. Um, That's insane. And it'll infer like travel time, which is, yeah, it's it's really interesting the way it captures data about you and... Um, it's kind of really eye-opening, but yeah, you can go back and check any day that you've 
So I don't know. I um, It's a huge win for privacy for people that care about this type of thing. I think I'm still going to keep my uh, information because, like you said, like it's already captured. They're going to do what they want with it. Sure. Um, all right. What do we got up next? All right. So American Nonprofit Research Institute, SRI International, has developed a prototype of what it's calling a police robot. Uh, the robot is meant to prevent accidents that occur when the police um, pull over drivers. And this cop bot is attached to a telescopic robotic arm that can extend from the side of the cop car to reach the window of the pulled over vehicle in front of it. So the officer is then able to communicate with the driver via a webcam, and from there, the police operator can scan the driver's license, spit out a ticket, and even deploy spikes to stop a driver from getting away. So I'm a little unsure about this one. I'm, I don't know. The video is pretty good. <laughs> it's kind of a funny-looking little robot. I don't know how I would feel if I, I saw that coming up the, to my window. The thing that like is just so surreal with this is that little cop hat on top of this little yep. computer screen. It's kind of cute. It's, <laughs> it's kind of like, cute. It's like it's it's trying to convey like uh, the only thing it's missing is like a badge and the gun off to the side, right? Like uh, Sure. I don't know. So, I want to read off some stats here um because this this is on the video, but if you're not watching the video, it's hard to see. So, it looks like uh what is that? 16,900 and uh wait, 16,915,000 one hundred and four nine hundred fifteen thousand one hundred four. I can't read numbers. Uh, drivers are pulled over in traffic. Um, around, I'm just going to round up. Around two thousand motorists have physical have had physical force used on them, and around five thousand officers are assaulted. Uh, Eighty nine of those motorists die, and eleven of those officers die. Um, so this this robot is aiming to kind of get between, um, you know, those those altercations as a way to prevent some of these. Uh, injuries or death. Um, so uh, it, it, as far as safety goes, I think this is a good idea. Um, like you said, I think it is a little goofy looking. To, it, it's literally just like a, a, if you think about this robot that you can extend from the front of your car off to the side of the car in front of you. Um, it is just, it, I can't, I can't imagine this being built on every cop car. Uh, and I think it's more of like a uh, proof of concept thing than an actual intent um to you see to how far out on the side of the cop car it sticks yeah it it well it's telescopic right so i'd have to get at least one full car in front of it and then probably a little bit more um depending on how far behind the cop car stops right because like in this example in the video they are stopping bumper to bumper and then the telescope is literally one level of telescopic um extension so that way it goes right up to the window and i think it's actually the same model of car it might not be but it's it's close enough to where the size of the car is is comparable but let's say you have like this big long truck that you're pulling over or a semi truck um, yeah and then you also need another uh telescoping thing although it looks like it does have some height correction there you can see it kind of mm -hmm. rising um but yeah that's it's uh it's interesting that the cop can kind of talk to them and do everything right from the car and um, I don't know. I'm kind of worried about what this is going to do for the stereotypes about law enforcement and yeah. donuts. If they can't even get out of their car for a routine traffic. <laughs> I hadn't even gone there, but yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> so, but I mean, I, I like the safety aspect. I don't know. What are you thinking about this? Um, I'm worried about kind of the other elements of a traffic stop. Cause I feel like the cop kind of gets to look at you, looks at your eyes, can smell for alcohol. I feel like there's a lot of other things going on other than just, taking the license and giving a ticket. Right. And I, I don't think this is meant to replace like a tradition. I think this is just the first line of defense, right? Sure. They extend this thing. If they see any signs of danger or if they can do the whole, uh, you know, action from their own seat, then great. If not, then they might have to get out and okay, step out of the vehicle. Let me see your eyes. Let me smell your breath, all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's meant as a replacement. I honestly think this is like a proof of concept thing more than anything. Um, but it's a, it's a fun idea to kind of entertain. Sure. Definitely. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, any other kind of applications for <laughs> I I'm, tr I'm struggling to think of like how else this might improve. Um, you know, maybe, maybe in integrating some artificial intelligence systems to detect whether or not a gun is present. I was um, thinking this kind of leads to the idea that, you know, why does a police officer even need to be in the car behind him? You know, if we have automated cars and we have an automated robot going up to the window, we have automated, you know, yeah. speed detectors. So well, yeah, you could have a you could have 
literally uh, like a like a drone operator from the police station and have uh, the cop interact from there. Um, that's the next that's the next step. Sure. All right. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back to break down the next the rest of the news right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Oh, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at uh, The Next Web, IEEE Spectrum, and Gizmodo for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join us on our Slack for the original articles. We do post those as we find them. All right, we got two more up for this week. Sabrina, what's up next? So the EU Commission has come out with seven requirements for building ethical AI. Um, so as I'm sure everyone's heard, there have been many ethical controversies surrounding artificial intelligence algorithms in the past few years, but recent advances in machine learning and neural networks have pushed artificial intelligence into sensitive domains such as hiring, criminal justice, and healthcare. In a recently published document entitled Ethic Ethics Guidelines for a Trustworthy AI, the European Commission has laid out seven essential requirements for developing ethical and trustworthy artificial intelligence. So these are human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, societal and environmental well-being, diversity, transparency, and accountability. And while we still have a lot to learn about AI, um, I, while we have a lot to learn while AI takes a more prominent role in our daily lives, uh, the EU Commission's guidelines, unpacked below, provide a nice roundup of the kind of issues that AI industry faces today. So yeah. what are you, <laughs> sorry about that. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. I think, uh, you know, uh, the best way to kind of approach this one might be to go uh, just one by one down this list, right? So you, sure. you mentioned um, human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, societal and inter environmental well-being, diversity, transparency, and accountability. So let's just kind of go down this list here uh, and, and bring up any kind of interesting facts that we see here. So human agency and oversight, um, so this is basically making sure that the users have a choice uh, to basically be subject to an automated decision. Um, and that kind of spirals down into legal effects uh, and, and um, you know, that it, it's a whole thing. So I, I think this one makes sense to me, right? Because you have like instances like the Cambridge Analytica study or uh, example, scandal, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think that's what we, as human factors practitioners, would probably advocate for the most is that human agency, make sure they have a role in this, um, you know, artificial intelligence system. Sure. Because especially when you release AI to start machine learning and just kind of let it go, you need someone overlooking to make sure it's not going down a dark hole or a rabbit hole or especially if it's on the Internet or picking up any kind of negative dark content. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they they need to be involved in some some aspect of it for sure. Because uh, like, do you remember um, a, a couple years ago they had this uh, this artificial intelligent bot on Twitter? That, That's exactly like, what I was thinking of. Yeah, yes. that like quickly devolved into this racist, sexist, like tweeting machine that like you know it, it was unstoppable. It kind of just took the the volatility of Twitter and kind of made a caricature of it and said this is this is the internet uh so, but i mean you know if a human was involved with that they could review the types of inputs that it was receiving and then the outputs that it generated sure. um moving on here technical robustness and safety so again like getting onto that safety side of things right they, they want to make sure that it minimizes unintentional and un unexpected harm um 
and prevents unacceptable harm to humans and the environment. So that's that's good that they're not only thinking about the humans that the artificial intelligence is interacting with, but also the environment surrounding it, right? Um, and I mean, we've seen news stories on the show, or maybe this is at HFES, I might be conflating, but um, where humans and robots are interacting in these environments where there is an AI system doing some, like, task, and it has, like this camera looking at where humans might operate. And if it senses a human in that area, it'll stop its operations in that area or severely slow its movement to accommodate for the human being in that zone. Uh, I think it's along those lines. Yeah. This makes me think of um, automated cars also. And they had oh, an yeah. example here where that, you know, you could put something over a stop sign so the automated car wouldn't stop because it wouldn't recognize it as a stop sign. Whereas a human would probably still be able to recognize that it was a stop sign. Um, and I mean, that brings up past accidents where just reflection has caused the automated car not to see different um, aspects in the environment. So that's definitely a safety concern with this type of AI. It's just constraints in the environment and things like that that can make it so it can't accomplish its job in a safe way. Right. Well, I mean, we even saw a couple of weeks ago um, that Tesla story about the dot in the middle of the yeah. road that was able to, you know, confuse it into going into the oncoming traffic lane. Um, and they use a couple other choice examples in this article that I won't get into, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so privacy and data governance. So uh, this one's looking at the information provided to the user um, as well as uh, data protection across uh, a system's life cycle, uh, as well as the information generated about the user. So all of this stuff is important for humans as well, right? It's like this is basically making sure that priva privacy and data piece of it is, you know, this ties into that nicely to that Google story, um, you know, and, and it's looking at the life cycle of the system, not just these like short term interactions. It's looking at, yeah, over, over the course of time. Sure. Well, and if AI is collecting a ton of data, you need to make sure that data is secure. So, you know, someone with bad intentions will be able to access it. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of um, sort of advancements in the privacy space with like the GDPR, um, and California just passed the uh, Consumer Privacy Act as well, um, and and you know it, there was a there was a gift that I posted in the Slack probably uh, a month or two ago of like browsing the net in 2019 where one thing would pop up and then say oh yeah we got cookies do you agree to all this data the the privacy information that we're collecting on you and it's just all these like pop ups about your data and so I don't know if that necessarily is solving the problem but it's heading in the right direction of like okay, we're passing laws that force these uh, websites at least to collect information about you. And now it seems like that's going to be um, pushed on to other artificial intelligence systems as well. Uh, we got transparency um, that, you know, um, they define it in three sort of main components, traceability, explainability, and communication. And so this is just an effort to make sure that the, the human um, knows what they're doing, um, they know where it's been and the, that the system can communicate effectively with the human as well. Sure, and this really ties into the trust people have in different AI. Um, if they understand the processing behind it, they're more likely to trust it appropriately to make the right decisions in different um, levels and contexts. Yeah, that's true too. I, th I think a lot of the research being done in trust and automation uh, falls into this category of transparency. Um, I mean, it really spans all this, but um, it's kind of interesting to see how they divide this up, right? I mean, all these things are absolute necessity. I'm trying to think of like, there's anything that's missing. I would assume not. I, I'm, I'm sure they consulted like experts in the field on this, but like, is this all encompassing or is there going to be something that slips through the cracks? I'm not sure. Um, we also got diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, which we've also seen in some other stories where, um, you know, we, we've talked about algorithmic bias before in the past where, like, these these systems that are based on algorithms might um, better distinguish white faces versus uh, black faces because they just are built by white people and they know what kind of characteristics. And it's just, it's built in without even the intent, right? And so what this is trying to get at is let's build systems that are fair, that are... Uh, that don't discriminate based on um, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, um, any of those things, right? So I, I, I think it's good that they outline this. I think we still have a long way to go on some of this stuff, but 
Uh, it's good that they're at least outlining it and making sure that people will adhere to it. Sure, yeah. There's a little blurb here that I wanted to just touch on. Sure. Um, uh, so a group of researchers at Boston University um, discovered a word embedding algorithms um, that were trained on online articles. And those algorithms had actually developed hidden biases, um, such as associating various jobs with different genders. And this was purely based on the online articles that they had access. So that kind of gets back to that whole chatbot thing also. Yeah. You, your your output is only as good as what the, comes in, you know, trash in, trash out. Sure. So um, this is this is yeah, getting it, making sure that it's not trash going in, so that way it's um, it's good. I like I like this next one here, societal and environmental well being. So it's this is kind of goes along with the other point that we made about um, you know the sort of uh, awareness. What was it? The robustness and safety, right? So it's it's thinking about the environment, and this one's actually looking at the environment, right? Not just the immediate environment, but like. Mother Nature. <laughs> so, like, we're looking at, um, you know, society and making sure that this AI is, is um, the intent is to benefit not individuals, but society, uh, and also, you know, won't damage the environment in the process, and I think that's great. Sure, and we want them to make people happy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we also have accountability here, uh, and that's the last one, but this is effectively just making sure that the whatever the output is from this ai like it the system is held accountable for the things that you know they are making and creating um but but that not that's not just the output that's like development deployment and use of these ai systems right so that that spans all aspects of the developmental life cycle sure and this would include any privacy um issues that occur with the ai i would think yeah, I think there's a lot of overlap, but I think that's by design. Sure. Um, I think, I think they're, um, or this is just me surmising that their intent with this is to kind of make sure they just capture everything, and hope that, uh, you know, the the redundancies will catch things that were overlooked in some of these other, um, other categories. I, I I'm interested to see kind of what types of artificial intelligence systems that adhere to these guidelines, um, you know, uh, they're, well, they're, they're not guidelines, they're requirements. So I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of systems are developed now um, when they have to take this stuff into account. Well, and um, how will they enforce these guidelines? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Because they're a little subjective, most of them also. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really interesting, right? So I think they're, let's see, I'm, I'm doing a quick scan here. Uh, ch -ch -ch. knowing the ch -ch -ch -ch. okay yeah I have no idea um, it does not say uh, it'll uh, let's see here it'll well the US has passed something similar called the algorithmic accountability act um, or they introduced it it's not passed uh, but but their check on that will require companies to have their AI algorithms evaluated by uh, the FTC uh, for known problems such as algorithmic bias as well as privacy and security concerns. So I'd imagine there's some oversight uh, committee that would kind of look at these and kind of say yay or nay, checks out or not. Yeah, um, definitely taking steps in the right direction, though. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, we got one more story. What do we have up last? All right. So Yonsei University Health System is opening a new hospital about 25 miles outside of Seoul. And this hospital will be decked out with some of the tech's hottest gadgets. So in this hospital, very sick patients in isolation rooms can visit with holograms of their loved ones. Uh, visitors will find their way around the hospital using an augmented, augmented reality-based indoor navigation system. Authorized medical workers will use facial recognition to enter secured areas. And patients can call a nurse and control their bed, lights, and TV with an Alexa-style voice assistant. This hospital is scheduled to open in February 2020, and SK Telecom will be in support of the technology with a 5G network, and they're considering securing it with some quantum cryptography. And this proposal is to bring a wide range of these AI design technologies together into one hospital. So I think this is really exciting, an awesome big step for healthcare. I don't yeah, I think, well, healthcare is a hot topic, right? And I think um, the whole system kind of needs an overhaul and and it does need to bring in some of these 
like technology is to bring it into the 21st century and, and really modernize uh, hospitals and healthcare. And, um, you know, some of these things that they're talking about here sound kind of far fetched, but really like the, the technology is there. I think the one that sounds most science fiction to me is the holograms, but even that's not terribly difficult, right? Like you can do augmented reality holograms of people. And I think they're already talking about using augmented reality and other, other situations like the navigation for indoor things. Um, you know, and we've seen that technology in like airports, for example, we've seen the navigation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's technology that's out there. It's just basically, th this is almost like a commitment to make sure that all of the best technology or the, the most um, cutting edge technology is in one place where uh, it's going to benefit a whole bunch of people that, um, you know, need the help. Um, the, the interesting thing to me is like the, the, the fact that now they're building in these kind of voice assistants into the hospitals, right? Like, can you imagine the, the type of agency that you get, um, even for simple questions, like imagine if you couldn't move your arms or check your phone or anything and just, you were able to speak and you're like, what's the weather like today? You know? And it's like, uh, who won the game or whatever, just think about the types of questions that you can ask it and that you would have to rely on like another human for, um, it's, we, we talk a lot about giving agency back to the people who lost it. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, and I would wonder what kind of um, workload we could maybe take off some of the nurses or front desk people oh, for sure. um, with this kind of uh, voice assistant too. Cause you know, nurses get called to the rooms to, you know, turn the lights off or adjust a bed, things that could easily be done by this type of voice assistant. Yeah. Um, you have a couple um, additional points here. Did you want to talk about those at oh, all? Sure, sure. Uh, so, the top one. Yeah. So, Peachy Hain, the executive director of nursing at Cedar Sinai Hospital in LA, um, so she's not actually involved in the Korean hospital project, but she said that all of these technologies should really, um, should be really important goals for hospitals. Um, but she does caution that a patient's room is very small. So as we add technology, we need to think about where it's going to go and how software might be integrated to reduce hardware in the room. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I just recently visited a hospital and uh, it it's kind of crowded. Um, but I and I can see why, you know, that technology might get in the way of some somebody whose job it is to actually go in and check on a patient. Um, but I think. What, what would be interesting to me is that if there is a demand for this type of thing, imagine if a station, imagine if those like IV stations, I don't even know what they're called, right? I was actually looking through one of the quick reference guides because I was like, oh, how do you, how do you build a quick reference guide for one of these things? <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, imagine if that on wheels actually had a voice assistant built in, right? Plugged into the Wi-Fi or, you know, just... So just think about adding it on to things that already exist in the ecosystem to like minimize the space involved. Um, especially like if you have that voice assistant built into every one of those, or maybe a pair of uh, AR goggles that you can just like pull off, you know, and, and that's another tool that you have at your disposal or maybe build those into the beds. And I know that's an additional cost, but if we can lump it in with other things as like an all in one package almost, then, then that's one way to get around that. Yeah. Well, and I hate to keep bringing up the privacy of data, but that's another thing that came up when I was looking at this. The idea of an Alexa in my hospital room would make me a little uncomfortable. You just set off like five people's Alexas. <laughs> more than five. I don't have, have an Alexa, so I'm not, I'm not familiar with the setups. So yeah. my apologies. That's okay. Yeah, no, you're right, though, because th those devices are always listening. Um, and that might give certain companies, more information about what happens in a hospital setting. So there is that. Um, but I'd imagine, you know, that at least Amazon, they have, well, they just came out with the first HIPAA um, compliant app. So, you know, they're kind of hopefully, I, I, I'd imagine some guidelines would be set forth like, hey, they can't always be listening here sure. except for the name. That's it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I would hope that that kind of goes without saying, but you're right. Like that does introduce more privacy concerns and um, would it cause more anxiety for people who didn't know that they weren't always listening? Sure. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing too. Um, so we kind of touched on this next point a little. Um, 
But just following up on Haynes' um, quote from earlier, so this was the director of nursing at Cedar sinai um, she says that this goal sounds feasible, but she has concerns about um, the extra space it would take up. So we kind of mentioned that, how we could potentially um, integrate an Alexa into one of those IV drip type right. machines. Um, and her example here was that a hologram visitor um, could come from the same device that provides the interpretive services for non-native speakers. So potentially just integrating that hologram um, capability into a pre-existing device in the room already. Um, and then remote surveillance for patients who need to be watched constantly could also potentially be integrated. And some of the same software could also log the information from the interpreter or surveillance directly into the patient's electronic medical records. So she's kind of reaching into the future here of potential right. ways this could be used to help medical uh, records be maintained as well. Well, yeah. And I mean, even think about like, um, you know, uh, really discreet cameras that are not really capturing video, but more like movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, let's say somebody gets up and falls down, that system could automatically call a nurse um, versus, you know, them sitting on the floor in the hospital for who knows how long before they're found. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be too long, but still just having something like that passively in the room, um, you know, and that, that artificial intelligence system, like, I feel like all these news stories really tie together really well today, but, um, well done, Nick. Thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pulled it together in the last quarter for a hail Mary. Does that, is that an effective sports analogy? I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. All right. I don't know if that's an effective sports analogy, let me know. But I think, you know, um, actually making sure that all these technologies talk together in a way that makes sense, um, you know, where it might all, it might have that passive video that detects a fall, but they could also say, um, the A word, I've fallen, please call somebody. And it would call, some, you know, like the A word, the A word. Is that how we're supposed to refer to it? Uh, that's how I refer okay. to it only because I have one. And I know if you're listening to something, it, it'll activate it. And so Noted. you can, you can say like, Alexa, order 500 pizzas from Domino's. <laughs> Really screw our I am really sorry for anyone that I just ordered 500 pizzas for. Um, but yeah, I, I think thinking about how all this technology um, kind of talks to each other is, is the big picture thing. And, and data fusion is, is uh, a really important part that I think needs to happen right for, for uh, something like this to become not only reality, but an effective reality. I don't know. That's that's kind of my two cents on it. Yeah. The futuristic hospital, though, is kind of a fun thing to think about, I think. Yeah, I absolutely love that idea. All right. It came from. It came from. That's right. We're moving on to It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Uh, any subreddit is fair game as long as it promotes, uh, you know, discussion among the community. That's us, human factors people, UX people, whatever it is. Um, we got a couple of them today. I think we can get through all of them. Uh, yeah, time checks out. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this first one here. This is actually from, um, we got one from every subreddit today, it feels like. This one's from the human factor subreddit, and I feel like this one's a, a, a pretty good discussion point here. So this is titled Human Factors and Ergonomic Society Accreditation. Um, this is by Callosity. Uh, and again, this is from the Human Factors subreddit. They go on to write, so I'm really interested in the field of human factors and currently pursuing my BA in psychology and looking to go to graduate school after, uh, for my finals, my, my master's in human factors. Um, I've been using the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society website as a directory to look for master's programs. And I noticed that some schools are officially accredited by them. Uh, considering I would want a job as a human factors and ergonomics engineer in the industry when I'm finished with my master's, does attending a school with the program accreditation actually give me more of an edge or is it desirable? That is, or is it more desirable than attending a school that doesn't have the accreditation? Thank you in advance. Sabrina, let me turn this to you. Have you ever in your experience, well, first off, did you attend um, a school with human factors and ergonomics uh, accreditation? I did, and I actually um, found my school on the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society website, probably exactly okay. on the page that this person's talking about. Probably. I am not sure if my alma mater is uh, uh, accredited <laughs> or not, uh, and that should be telling, right? Uh, let, me, let me ask you another question. Has that impacted your ability to find um, employment or opportunities? Not to my knowledge. Um, I'm not sure... If that accreditation, what weight that has? 
your school. Oh, your school is yeah, on there. Yeah, it's on there. So, um, I mean, it's possible that the unaccredited ones, maybe I just haven't come in contact with any of them, so I don't really have much to say about them. Yeah, I, 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 I let me let me say this though, like I've never encountered a situation where they're like, "Oh, your your school was accredited, so you must be great." Um, and so I I can't speak from the other side of the fence whether or not you would run into a oh did you are, are you really good because your program isn't accredited i would imagine not um and in fact i think one of the comments on here um is it's not a major consideration um so i i they mentioned they've never heard it in interviews or professional life um so I, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say maybe looking at the coursework and what exactly the program entails is maybe more of a tall tell sign of a good program. That's a better, yeah. Yeah, so if, you know, they're taking a lot of courses you're really interested in and you feel like it would give you a great overview of human factors and the ability to kind of implement it in the workplace, then yeah, that's probably a great program, whether it's accredited or potentially not. Um, so I wouldn't say all accredited programs are great and all non accredited are awful. Yeah, and honestly, like we've given this advice on the show before, uh, choose by the professor. Like if you're going to work with a professor, um, choose the work that most closely aligns to the type of things that you want to work on because experience, in my experience, um, kind of outweighs everything else. You know, if you have experience working on the things that you want to work on, that speaks more volumes than uh, I was accredited at this university. All right, we got two more. Uh, this one is from the HCI, Human Computer Interaction subreddit. Um, which I don't know if we've ever featured on the show before, but here it is. Uh, this is an undergrad student who wants to get involved with HCI in the future. Help! Uh, this one's written by, I'm going to mess up this name, Ferk and Lodi. Ferk and Lodi. Uh, I don't know. How, how would you pronounce that? I thought it was like Lord Furquan, like backwards from oh. what's Shrek's, the, the Lord and Shrek. What's uh, I don't, like that. that sounds familiar. Okay. I don't know. Uh, but Ferk and Lodi <laughs> goes on to write, I'm a sophomore in college. I'm a computer science major. I've always been very oriented towards design and art that happens to be a hobby of mine. And combining my undergraduate major, major with something that I enjoy sounds like a good plan. However, I'm not sure about the courses I should be taking in undergrad if I want to pursue an HCI in grad school, or in this case, human factors, um, or possibly even uh, at a doctorate level. My college offers a course in HCI, which I obviously will be taking. Uh, but other than that, which courses would you recommend I study? Uh, P.S. I also plan on doing summer internship in an HCI-centered lab. Uh, well, I think first off, that's great that you're in a lab. That's that's uh, that's a huge step up from others um, that maybe not. Wow! Hey, look at that. I uh, should probably mute my my computer while we're doing a podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, you know you already you already have a huge leg up. So, uh, what do you think, Sabrina? What kind um, of courses? Maybe potentially looking at some programs you'd want to be in and seeing what the prerequisites are. Uh, I know when I was going into my master's program, once I had applied to it, I realized that I was missing two of the prerequisites. So that kind of fed into what I was going to take the following semester. Yeah, so you had to go back and take them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great piece of advice is taking a look at um, the types of programs that you want to apply to and taking those classes and, and applying to. I think some just general good knowledge would be like uh, behavioral statistics and analysis. Um, although not like super... I mean, you can you can use it, obviously, but it kind of gives you insight as to how to analyze. And a lot of classes will go into how to um, perform research with human participants. And I think that's, especially if you're getting into human-computer interaction or human factors, that's something that's going to benefit you no matter where you're at, um, is the ability to look at data and analyze that data and interpret that data that you've gathered from humans that are using the thing that you're, you're designing. Uh, it all kind of ties back. I think psychology programs are, are good for that. Um, engineering classes can be really helpful for understanding requirements um, and uh, sort of requirement development uh, and how that plays into, you know, how, how you meet those requirements by designing things effectively. I think that's something to think about too, kind of higher level. Um, I mean, ultimately though, like undergrad, just do what you need to do to get to grad school. And then from there, that's when you can really dig into some of that other stuff. Sure. Well, and HCI is a little vague and broad. So depending on whether you want to go into kind of the UX designer versus human factors, 
I would say maybe like a graphic design course. Yeah. Kind of weird to say, but that's something I really wish I would have taken in my undergrad. Um, and then if you're planning on going more on the human factor side, maybe sensation and perception. That's a class that oh, I still yeah. refer back to my textbook constantly just to look at color thresholds and things like that when you're implementing designs. Yeah, I think those are also really great recommendations. Um, okay, one more. This one's from the user experience subreddit. And this one's by uh, Taysay73. Uh, they ask for tips working with developers who don't listen. All right, folks, this one's going to be a long one. Uh, just like the title, I recently finished my second hackathon. My team uh, contains me and four developers, and I, throughout the whole time, had a hard time communicating. Like, they didn't want to talk or answer my questions. I asked them questions about what they do, what they want to build, which, uh, thank God, they answered. But every time I asked them questions about users, they just ignored and kept doing whatever they do. One of them told me to just create a header and footer. I told him, even with just a header and footer, I need at least what kind of information you want to get from the user's email, password, ID, gender, etc. And what do you want them to do when they visit the website? Then silence. I talked to a guy who came up with the ideas and gave me his research and provided me with enough information so I could build a wireframe. The next day, they just left, and I don't know if they mistook me as a web developer, but on Slack, the dude expect me to somehow man magically finished an API and did the HTML, CSS coding for the website, even though I told them how I only know... I'm not going to read the rest of this. What, what kind of hackathon is this? Like, <laughs> where did you go? Like, is this just like a, a development jam or something? I don't know. I'm confused on this person's background. Yeah. I, so, like, okay, well, let's let's just look at this question, right? How do you deal with developers who don't listen? Uh, and it sounds like this person had a really rough experience um, with people that they were unfamiliar with uh, in a hackathon environment where, at least in my experience, you're supposed to come together and kind of utilize each other's strengths um, and kind of fill in for each other's weaknesses and it doesn't sound like that happened. But um, how do you communicate with developers who don't listen so this kind of brings me back to grad school a little bit. We had a class we had to take. It was actually a com computer science course in the computer science building. And they put one human factor student in with a group of computer science students, and we created a website. And so I had a lot of this, these kind of interactions where they just treated me like I didn't know anything because I wasn't the one doing the coding. And something I found to be really useful was to speak code to them. So I actually learned a decent amount of Java and Visual Basic code so that I just understood the way code was put together. So then when they're saying things like, you know, you wouldn't understand or you don't know how we're going to do that, I would say, you know, yeah, let's do a for loop with an if-then statement inside of it. You know, talk to them in a way Whoa. where they're like, oh, she understands what we're trying to do. And just kind of you have to earn their respect sometimes. It's definitely yeah, something I, I learned. I think so, too. I think if you, like, a lot of it's foot in the door, right? If you can get your foot in the door and get them to kind of see where you're coming from, I mean, thankfully, in my experience, I've always worked with developers that have uh, at least understood what our mission is to do, and it's you know to make the interface um, and workflows more cohesive for the users. Uh, however, there are always difficult developers, and you know, like you said, like speaking their language can can help you be on the same page, um, and and understanding also what's possible in code can. Um, you know, also affect how they not only perceive you, but uh, evaluate your uh, recommendations as well. Like, so for example, um, there was a moment a couple months ago where I had proposed a change on a project and, you know, the developer flat out called me out on it. He said, if we did that, that would be a lot more work than, um, do you remember this? <laughs> yeah, I think I know what you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> he called me out on it and said that would be a lot more work because that would mean um, a bunch of rewriting in the back end. And it's because I didn't have an understanding of how it worked. And had I known that, you know, like I wouldn't have recommended that. I would have recommended a separate option. And so I had to backtrack and say, okay, well, I understand that. What if we did this, that, the other thing? And would that work? And I think that resonated a lot more with them when I was willing to um, work with them and not just like tell them what to do for better, lack of a better term. Um, but if you understand kind of what the limits of the programming software is and, um, you know, how they operate within that space, it, it's going to be a lot easier of an experience for you. So, yeah, make friends. That's that, <laughs> that's what I have to say to that. All right. Well, I can't believe it, but it's already time to go. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's It's been a day. It's been a day for sure. Um, 
You know, if you like our story, let us know what you think of those new stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Um, you can join us on the discussion on our, on our Slack or follow us all over our social channels at H Factors Podcast. Uh, if you like, you can email us. We're at show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. No after show for the next couple weeks because uh, Blake's out this week. I'm out next week. Uh, you know, but we'll be back soon. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to give a special thanks to Sabrina Moran for filling in for Blake this week. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to find out more about, uh, I don't know, robot hospitals? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or on the Human Factors Cast Slack channel. Excellent. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for editing our video each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. <laughs>